thank you for joining our lifelong learning series for alumni. My name is Nadira Mayweather. I'm the director of alumni relations here, and we're super excited that you've joined us. We have a partnership that we're super excited about with our School of Continuing and Professional Studies, and it's for us to offer benefits to our alumni. We know that you come to Georgia College and we provide a great educational experience and holistic experience for you. And we just want to make sure that as alumni, you continue that care and you continue to feel like there are opportunities for you. And so out of that care for you, this series was birthed. So it's a partnership between us and um, School of Continuing and Professional Studies. And with us from that school is uh, Deanna Sorrells, who is also an alum. Deanna, would you like to share anything about the college um, with our alum while you're on? I'm a class of 2022 alum, um, and I work under Angela Crisco at the School of Continuing Professional Studies. Um, so if y'all have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, we're really excited about this partnership and these uh, future programs. Thank you, Deanna. Another program that we're super excited to share with you all is an opportunity to travel to Greece. And so we're going to be sharing some information with you in the chat, but there is a Greece trip that is scheduled for May 31st through the first week of June. And so that's a wonderful opportunity for alum to come back. Maybe either you've studied abroad there previously, or you always wanted the opportunity to study abroad and never did. And so we encourage you to take advantage of that trip. There is an information session that is coming up in early November. Um, and so if you check out the link that Ruth, thank you so much, Ruth, has posted in the chat and the flyer, it'll share more information with you about our Adventure to Greece tour. So we really hope that you'll take advantage of that opportunity. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the special guests that we have with us today. Um, we have as our leader for this session, our alum, Brent Evans. Dr. Evans. Evans is an associate professor of economics and an alum of Georgia College. After completing a PhD in economics, Brent spent three years at Dalton State College before rejoining us here at GCSU in 2016. While his research and teaching interests are broad, he's now focused primarily on personal finance education. Brent is currently pursuing a master's degree in financial planning at the University of Georgia and is writing an open access personal finance textbook that will be completed in 2024. We're so honored that Brent is willing to share the information with us and it's going to be such a treat and we hope that you will enjoy. Feel free to engage. Just as a little bit of housekeeping, we ask that if you have a question, um, go ahead and throw up in your, um, you'll see in your reactions, there's the little thumbs up symbol or raise hand symbol. So please make sure that you interact with us today. And then while this is a conversation that's timed and recorded, please also feel free to interact. So Brent is okay with if you have questions that are just burning within you that you throw that hand up and we'll address you. Or if, you'd, if you're more comfortable putting in the chat, we can also respond from the chat. So I'll move out of the way and turn the, the screen over to Brent. And again, welcome to our GCSU Alumni Lifelong Learning Series. Thanks for being here today, Brent. Thank you so much, Nadir, and I want to thank everyone else for coming. Uh, you know, I'm a college professor, so typically I'm up there in front of the whiteboard, but I'm going to do my best here with this Zoom presentation today uh, to help you guys out with something I'm really passionate about, which is developing a financial plan, making good financial choices. So let me share my screen. Let me jump right into this here. This is kind of a difficult thing uh, to try to discuss personal finance in just, you know, 30 or 45 minutes, but I'm going to do my best, and if nothing else, Maybe I'll inspire you a little bit to uh, really dive in and think about the choices that you're making uh, regarding your finances. So as a, as a bit of motivation here, I want you to think about what might determine your life satisfaction when you're 80, 90 years old. And I, I think uh, one thing that shows up in the literature is that connectedness plays a great role in that. Your family, your friends, your deep relationship that you have with others. Uh, additionally, your health. Being strong, for example, is really important later in life. Uh, a lot of injuries that people sustain can become life-threatening if they don't have proper strength, physical strength. Um, so being able to develop your muscles, going to the gym, these sorts of things matter a lot. And the third one there is your financial well-being. And that's the one, I, of course, I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and I would just say, you know, these three things, which are shown again and again in research, to be really important for your, for your future and your, your self-reported level of happiness later on in life. The first two, it's really hard to have a whole lot of direct control over. Um, your family, your friends. There's only so much you can do to establish strong relationships. Uh, your health, your health matters quite quite a bit, but your health is often based on uh, the genes that you have, 
you can go to the gym, you can pump some weights, but really, if you go to the gym a few times, do you really feel any stronger? Do you really feel any more prepared? Hard to say. But financial well-being, you really get this tangible bang for your buck. If you can start aggressively saving and investing early on in your life, then the benefits in the future uh, clearly show themselves out. Um, so as an example of that, if you were to save and invest $1,000 at age 40 and you get normal returns in the stock market, that'd give you about $45,000 at age 80. So while I might try to go to the gym today, while I might pump some weights, it's hard for me to really see where that's benefiting me. But if I can make some good financial choices early on in life, it's really easy to see the benefits of those fruits of your labor. So I hope today that I can help you uh, develop a financial plan. That's what we're going to be talking about. And these are the core ideas we're going to be discussing. Um, first of all, investing optimally, choosing what to invest in. That is a surprisingly easy part of finance. Really, uh, if you're wanting to invest in stocks, the best thing to do is just diversify. Buy all of the stocks you can. There's various ways to do that. Uh, the easiest way is probably with something called an index fund. If that's not on your radar, an index fund, I encourage you to look into that. Uh, but that being said, what I'm mostly going to talk about today is tax avoidance. That's something that uh, probably a lot of us have similar um, options to do. We probably have 401k plans that are available to us, IRAs, things like that. And maximizing those plans is one of the critical steps to developing a, a viable financial plan. So we're going to talk about tax avoidance. And uh, finally, we're going to discuss creating goals. Uh, and so what direction you should be taking. When you're thinking about what your life looks like, uh, you really should be starting at the end. Think about what the end of your life wants to, what you want that to look like, and then work backwards. Um, I know a lot of people that live very arbitrarily. They kind of just go through life just saving X percent of their money. That's better than nothing. But what I really think you should be doing is think about where you want to be when you're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, and then work backwards. See what you need to do today to accomplish those goals. And finally, you got to figure out a way to evaluate and maintain your uh, financial plan. So if you can develop a financial plan that uses tax shelters, then invest optimally. Uh, you don't have to do everything perfect. If you can just do those things, I think you'll be really happy with the success you have later on in life. So let me hop into it here. This is my attempt to be interesting. <laughs> um, when it comes to deciding what to invest in, I think you need to try to develop some sort of ranking system. Uh, what a lot of people do is that they have some sort of idea of the different sort of financial plans they should be using. They have some idea that they need to put money in their 401k. They may be saving for their kid's college. Well, what I would say is you need to rank those preferences. And we're going to try to do that today. You know, We're going to try to set some up at the top. One up for the top for a lot of people would be in Roth IRA. If you're seeing this presentation and this is the first time you've ever heard of a Roth IRA, I want you to write it down. I want you to take note of it because this is definitely something that should be on your radar moving forward. A Roth IRA plan is something that probably everyone in this chat can use. What it allows you to do is put money into it and then withdraw it in the future completely tax-free. So if you're under the age of 50, you can put $6,500 in this year in 2023, and that money will never be taxed again at any point in the future. And what's especially useful about a Roth IRA compared to other types of investment vehicles that we're going to discuss is you can take out your contribution at any time. So this is what I mean by this. Okay, let's say this year I put in $6,500 and next year I've got $8,000 in my account. I've had some growth in my account. Next year, I can actually pull out that $6,500 even though I'm not at retirement age and use it for any purpose whatsoever. It provides a lot more flexibility the different, different types of accounts that are like a 401k. A 401k, you got to wait until you're 59 and a half, all right? Or the Roth IRA, you can take out your contributions at any time. So for a lot of people, this should be at the top of your list, maybe like the University of Georgia is in the SEC. Put it at the top of your list and prioritize putting money into that account, all right? And you got to stop me if you have any questions. So also near the top of that uh, list is something called a health savings account. All right. So if you're trying to build a financial plan and you've never heard of a health savings account, I really encourage you to look into this because a health savings account is one that a lot of people don't know about and they're really missing out on some amazing tax savings. An HSA allows you to contribute up to $7,750 in 2023 if you are on a family health insurance plan. But what's unique about this plan is it's only available to those that use a high deductible 
insurance account. So if you have some more other type of health insurance plan, like a PPO or an HMO or maybe a comprehensive plan, you probably don't know about an HSA because you maybe have never had access to one. But what's really nice about an HSA is it allows you to put money in and completely avoid taxes forever on that money that you put in as long as you use it on medical expenses in the future. Unlike 401ks, unlike Roth IRAs, where you still have to pay some taxes, the HSA allows you to avoid taxes going in and going out. What I mean by that is if you put $5,000 into an HSA, that reduces your taxes today. It reduces your 2023 taxes. And in the future, if you pull that money out to cover a medical expense, you don't pay any taxes then either. You avoid federal, state income taxes, you avoid social security taxes and Medicare taxes. For a lot of people, that means you're going to be saving about 35 to 40 percent on your expenses. So with 100,000 plus uh, dollars worth of medical costs over the course of your life, we're talking 40, 50,000 dollars in savings that you might generate by using an HSA. Like a 401k, like an IRA, you can invest this money. So it is an absolutely tremendous place to put your money. I always tell students it's really the first place you should be looking for a lot of people. Okay, that's an, a health savings account. So you can see there I've got Alabama in the image, top program in the SEC football ranks. They're near the top. HSA likewise should be near the top. What I'm trying to do is help you prioritize because there's so much out there you can do with your money. But if we focus more on the very most important plans, I think you'll see you get the most bang for your buck. So that's an HSA. By the way, if you happen to work for Georgia College, we get a match on this account. So for money we put in, the university system of Georgia matches that amount that we put in. I think it's $750 on the family plan. So you really don't want to miss out. Uh, another potentially really valuable tax shelter. Now I chose Tennessee because, you know, Tennessee has been uh, not very good the last several years, but they started to improve over the last couple. Same kind of deal with the 529 plan. Its usefulness has really improved for a lot of people in the last couple of years, and I'll explain why. Uh, 529 is different from the first two plans we talked about. You know, a Roth IRA is a very flexible plan. You can basically use it for anything. An HSA plan, you can use it for medical expenses. It's a little bit less flexible. A 529 plan is even more restrictive. You really can only use it to cover education expenses. But it has gotten a little bit easier to use in the past couple of years. Here's the reason why. When you put money into a 529 plan, it doesn't do much to affect your current state taxes. The only thing it does is it reduces your state income taxes. It doesn't affect your Social Security, your Medicare taxes, or your federal income taxes. It doesn't do anything with that. But when you put money into a 529, it does reduce your state income taxes. And when you pull the money out of your 529, you don't pay any taxes at that point. So it's another tax shelter. It's another way to avoid taxes. A lot of people use this for uh, paying for their kids' college education, and that is a pretty good way to use it. So the way this would work is, when your kids are of any age, you can put money into your 529, that money can be invested, and then when your kids are in college, you can pull that money out to pay for tuition. When you pull that money out to pay for tuition, you don't face any taxes or fees. So it's kind of a relatively good tax efficient way to pay for college. What a lot of people don't know, however, is that a 529 plan can also be used for primary education. So if your kid is in a private school, and let's say they're in third grade, you could actually use money in your 529 to cover their third grade tuition. So what I've encouraged a lot of people to do, if they, if they have kids that go to private school, put money into your 529 to avoid state income taxes today, and then pull it right back out to cover uh, their tuition payments. In doing so, you can skip some of the state income taxes that you otherwise would have to pay. I know that's kind of a complicated thing for me to explain here via Zoom, but again, I'm just trying to expose you to these ideas. So if you have a kid in private school, you really want to look into a 529 plan. This is super low-hanging fruit. It's an easy thing you can do to save a little bit of money. And what's made this plan even better over the last year is now money in a 529 plan can be rolled over into a Roth IRA for the person that owns the plan. So I've got two kids. If they end up going to college via scholarship and they don't use their 529 plan, uh, you know, so they've got $20,000 in their plan that they never used, now you can roll that money into a Roth IRA. We already know a Roth IRA is a really good plan. So for my kids, if they're able to keep that 529 plan intact, 
they now have a really good exit strategy to free that money up. They can roll it right into a Roth IRA. And that is something that is completely new for 2023. And a lot of people simply don't know about it yet. So this makes the 529 plan a lot more valuable today than it was a few years ago. Just like Tennessee is a lot better now than they were a few years ago. If you're allowing me to stick with this kind of lousy analogy. Brent, we do have one question yeah. that's come through the chat. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's, do you have to have dependents to have a 529? No, you do not. So you can open up a 529 plan for anyone. So if you've got, uh, you know, a niece or a nephew or even just like a family friend, you can open up a 529 for them. Uh, the one thing to note, however, about a 529 plan is it is in the beneficiary's name. So you open up a 529 uh, account for a niece uh, that niece now owns that money and you really can't recover that. That's their money that they can use for education expenses or to roll into a Roth IRA. Does that make sense? All right, so moving on here. Here are the kind of steps you need to think about. All right, I expose you to a couple ideas. That's what I'm trying to do here is just expose you to some different ideas. So talked about the Roth IRA talked about the 529 plan, talked about HSAs, three plans that are really useful for a lot of people. So now let's think about maybe large scale, how you want to develop a financial plan. And I really think you need to first uh, think about your goals. All right. Don't just go through life arbitrarily. Don't just save a little bit of money and just see what's going to happen. Try to figure out roughly what you want to do later in life. You know, do, do you see your retirement as being something where you're kind of chilling at home, not spending a lot of money, or do you expect yourself to be going on a lot of vacations? Well, which of those routes you take is going to really hopefully influence the type of decision you're going to make today. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get into now. Your age and your lifestyle during retirement, the inheritance that you want to leave to maybe loved ones, and also the types of expenditures you're going to make later in life. Those types of things, your expectations about the future should really inform what you're trying to do today. And as it always is the case in financial planning, which is kind of frustrating, uh, it's easiest to it's easiest to reach for those goals early in life. All right, I noticed Logan. I noticed you're on this uh, this uh, session here, Logan Parker. He's a recent graduate of Georgia College, and he made some really good financial planning early in life. If you can do that when you're younger, you just get so much bang for your buck. Uh, if you can save a lot of money in your early to mid twenties, frankly, that just goes so much further than when you're in your forties and fifties. So. What I would say to people is, uh, if you haven't really developed a good financial plan, you don't want to wait. You want to do that as soon as you possibly can, which will give you more chance to grow your money and more chance to take on risk because it does get uh, tougher when you're older. So again, uh, these power rankings, I know it's a kind of a silly analogy, but this is how I think about my own finances. I want to put things in order to make things easy for myself, Okay. And uh, this is just how I set it up for me. It's going to be different for you. Okay. I, I work for a public institution, so I don't have a 401k. If you work for a for profit company, you probably do have a 401k. So all of us have a different list of priorities. All of us have a different list of, uh, of different investments we can choose among. Um, but what we do have is probably somewhat similar goals. We want to retire, we want to probably buy a house. Uh, we do have some goals in mind. So this is my order. Okay. In regards to my power rankings, the first thing I want to do is make sure I'm covering my expenses. I want to make sure I have money in my checking account to pay for expenses. I probably want to develop some money, you know, set aside to cover expenses. Maybe, you know, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars worth of cash that's available for me if I have a car breakdown or a roof leak, something like that. But once I've achieved basically goal number one, that first one on the list is really about survival. All right. That's about having the money I need to cover my expenses. Once I'm covering my expenses, I want to get more grand with my thinking here. And the very next thing I'm going to look at is anything with a match. Anything where my company is going to give me free money, that's the next place I want to prioritize my money. For a lot of people, that's a 401k match. So if your company is saying, you know, we'll match the first 3% of your income that you put in your account, you should do that before you're even entertaining anything else on this list. That should come higher up in the priority. For me, the next thing I look at is my HSA, my Roth IRA, and so forth down the list. But I'm not touching, I'm not touching number five, number six, and number seven on this list until I have completed those other goals at the top. I am moving down at the list. In other words, if you see this kind of drink dispenser over here on the right, that is not how I would recommend you develop your financial plan 
but it's what I see from a lot of people. A lot of people will say, I've got these different places I can put my money. I can put my money in a 529. I can put my money into a Roth IRA. And they'll just sprinkle with little bits of money into each of those accounts. I don't think that's going to give you your best tax savings. That's probably not going to be ideal. Instead, you should do something that looks more like this, which is fill up the bucket at the top. Start at the top, fill up the first bucket, fill up your emergency fund, and do that before you even think about going to the next level down in your priority list. So I'm going to put cash in my accounts and make sure I cover my expenses. Then I'm going to put anything I've got to, to get a match. I'm going to make sure I'm matching, you know, putting money in to get my 401k match. Then I'm going to go to my HSA. And I'm not going to move anywhere else until I've completely filled up my HSA. And I'm probably not going to get down to number five, six, and seven on my account every year. But by having these set up in order, it makes it a lot easier for me to plan. Okay, I'm trying to make something that's very complex a lot simpler. I don't want to think about where my money needs to go. I want my list in front of me, and I'm just following my list of priorities. I think if you can do that, it'll make it a lot easier for yourself to narrow down this complicated decision you've got to make to just simple choices. So build your power rankings. That would be my recommendation to you. All right? So one, set goals. Figure out what you want to achieve. Work backwards to see what you need to do to achieve that amount. Two. Create some sort of power rankings. Your power rankings may change over time. You know, putting money, saving for college, that's probably not something that matters to you when you don't have kids, but when you get older, maybe it will matter. So set power rankings up. Be willing to be flexible with those in the future. Third, choose your investments and determine your savings you need to reach those goals. Figure out what you need to invest in, okay? So for me, this is going to be different for different people, but for me, I just want you to kind of show you what a plan might look like. Number one, I'm setting my goals. I want to retire at age 52. That's not arbitrary. There's a reason for that. At age 52, I'll be 25 years into my working career, and I'll be eligible for my pension at Georgia College. It gives me this very tangible, realistic, practical target that I have in mind. Now, when I get to 52, I may decide that I want to keep working, but I'm going to at least give myself that option. I'm going to save enough so when I get to 52, I've got my exit strategy in mind. That's my goal. That's what I'm mo moving towards. Second, I'm going to implement my power rankings. Every year, I'm just going to run through the rankings, all right? Every year, I'm going to make sure I have my money to cover my expenses, then I'm going to move to anything with a match and so forth. Every single year, I'm just going to go down that list. Three, I'm going to choose my investments and determine sort of what I need to do to reach my goals. That's going to be different for different people, all right? The goals that you might have, again, going to be different depending on what you expect your life to be like. But regardless of your plan, you do need four, step four in this process, which is to monitor. Spend some time thinking about where you stand and making sure you're staying on those goals. For me, one day a month, it's, it happens to be the seventh of every month, I sit down for one hour, usually crack open a beer, and I just look at my finances. I look to see what I'm doing. I look to see if I'm achieving my goals. And if I see that I'm undersaving, if I see that I'm oversaving, well, then I make my adjustments. If I've got more money than I thought I would have, well, then I'm going to go back to my list and say, you know what? I've got extra money to put in my Roth IRA. Let me attribute to that Roth IRA. If I look and I see that I'm not saving enough, I might say, well, maybe I need to slow down my contributions to my HSA. But I'm doing something to make sure that I'm staying on my plan. All right. Again, this is just unique to me. But I think if you set up goals like this, that would be a really good way to structure your plan. All right. Moving on here. Couple more things. All right. So that that's sort of a general way to think about personal finances. Learn enough about the financial plans that are available to you. Learn enough about those tax shelters and then try to develop a plan that you can implement and monitor. All right. That's the general way you should try to develop your plan, in my opinion. But before uh, I, I move on, I, I do want to talk about a couple more things that you might that might not be on your radar that I think could be really valuable to you. OK, so one of those. Is target date funds. Target date funds are a relatively new uh, financial invention. They've only been available in a lot of financial plans for the last, uh, in like the last half a decade or so. Um, a target date fund is a really nice catch-all place that you can invest your money. Um, you may know a little bit about stocks. You may a little know a little bit about bonds, and you probably have a, some understanding that as you get older, you should reduce your risk. What's really nice about a target date fund is it does it automatically for you. So let's say you've got a Roth IRA or a 401k plan. 
chances are in your 401k plan, if you go look at the list of options that are available to you, you're going to see a lot of stuff you can invest in. But one of those that should pop up is a target date fund. And you're going to see target dates with a year, like target date 2045. Let me try to explain how this works. Okay, a target date fund is a type of a dynamic investment plan that you can put your money into. It's not stable over time. It actually changes through time. So let's say I invest in a target date 2045 plan. That account actually reacts or acts as if I'm going to retire in 2045. So depending on the year you choose, it actually has a different set of investments that you're going to invest in. So for example, with a 2045 plan, that account assumes I'm going to retire in 22 years. And as such, it will develop a financial plan for me accordingly. 2045 means I still got 22 years until retirement. So it is going to hold primarily stocks, probably 85% stocks, something like that. But as I get older, the account is naturally going to transition away from stocks and into bonds. And when I re reach my retirement age in 2024, 2045, it's going to hold primarily bonds. So it's a really unique type of investment because you can put your money into it and you don't have to think about really doing anything else through time. On its own, it will get less risky through time. So if you don't really want to do a lot of thinking in your financial planning, if you want to keep things simple, put all your money in these target day funds, all of your invested money, and recognize that you're getting diversification, you're getting a mix of stocks and bonds, and you're getting that nice benefit of reducing your risk as you age. Let's keep things simple. Target date fund is a really simple place to invest your money. The second thing to think about is an expense ratio. All right. So, uh, you know, I'm just trying to hit the, the most important topics, in my opinion. Um, when you invest in a 401k, IRA, any other kind of account, um, the company that you invest through, they're called a vendor, they're going to charge fees. So with your 401k, maybe you use Charles Schwab or uh, Fidelity or Vanguard, one of these large banks, they're going to charge fees. And these fees uh, can really affect you in an adverse way. So as an example, let's imagine you put $10,000 in a stock fund for 30 years. $10,000 invested for 30 years. That's going to give you about $174,000 if you get the normal stock market return of about 10%. But that's without any fees. When you look at your 401k or IRA, what you're going to find is these companies could be charging some pretty exorbitant fees. For example, you might notice they're charging a 1% expense ratio. A 1% fee doesn't sound so bad. All right. 1%. I mean, 1% of $100. That's just $1. That doesn't sound so bad. So, what a lot of people think is a 1% expense ratio on a $10,000 investment would just cost them a hundred bucks, just 1% of $10,000. But in reality, an expense ratio is a fee that is levied continuously through time. So 1% expense ratio doesn't mean they're just gonna charge you 1%. It means they're gonna charge you 1% every year for the entirety of your investing life. In this case, for 30 years. It doesn't just affect what you're investing, it affects all of the growth that you're going to receive. So if you invest for 30 years with a 1% expense ratio, instead of getting $174,000, you're going to have $132,000 after 30 years. So what sounds like a pretty nominal fee, 1%, ends up costing you about $42,000 over the course of a 30-year life. Maybe there's not a whole lot you're going to take away from today's lesson, but a simple thing you could do is look at what you're investing in and see what the expense ratios are like. If you see anything approaching 1% or certainly beyond 1%, you need to get out of that, okay? It is completely unreasonable in this day and age to be paying such large fees because uh, financial transactions have gotten really cheap, investing has gotten really cheap, okay? Fees are gonna eat you alive if you let them. So just an example of uh, the types of fees you might see, um, this is actually something I pulled up for my HSA account. So this is just some different financial options that I have. Uh, you know, it can kind of be overwhelming to look at all these different options you have in front of you. If you look over here to the last column, this is your gross expense ratio. So if I invested in one of these accounts, you can see, for example, 
the first one would charge me a 0.75% expense ratio. That's not unbelievably large, but I wouldn't just want to haphazardly invest in that. I would want to see what other options I have. And in my HSA, I've got those target date funds that I talked about before. I love these target date funds, okay? As you can see, the expense ratio, 0.08%. That means they're only going to charge me 0.08% for every dollar I invest through the course of my investing history. So you don't have to get complicated. Often keeping it the simplest is the best way. Not only uh, do these target date funds have the lowest fees, but they also are the most diversified, are likely to earn very good returns, and they reduce your risk as you age. So a lot of people look at these different accounts and they want to get complicated. You don't have to do it. You could essentially just choose the date that you expect to retire. Maybe you expect to retire in 2048. Well, you could put most of your money in the target date 2050 plan, and I guarantee you, you'd be outperforming most of your peers. That's all you have to do. Keep it simple. Find the accounts that are diversified, figure out a way to reduce risk, and do so with low fees, and I promise you, you're going to do a lot better than most people. You don't have to overcomplicate things. So I want to thank you for your time. I do have one more slide after this, but I do want to thank you for your time, and I do want to maybe raise awareness to something that I'm working on right now. I guess this is my plug. Um, I'm developing an open, an open access textbook uh, at freefinancebook.com. If you go to that website today, you're not going to see a whole lot there. Um, but in spring, I'm on sabbatical, and I'm going to be developing this full textbook. I don't have anything to gain from it. Uh, I'm not charging any fees. In fact, it doesn't even have any advertisements. I'm losing money on this. But what I'm trying to do is develop something where you can go in and you don't have to worry about my intentions. You can go in and learn about uh, personal finance at your own pace. Um, so come May or June of next year, I'm hoping this thing will completely be done. It's going to be a textbook. It's also going to include lecture videos. It's basically a place for self-guided learning. So I hope you'll check that out. As a last slide, and uh, I'll let you out of here after this, and of course I'll answer any questions you have, but as a final slide that I prepared today, uh, as a last chance maybe to motivate you, I want to think you to think about how much your time is worth. You know, it, if I offered to pay you to come over to my house and work for me, what would you require? Would you, would you do it for $20 an hour? Would you do it for $100 an hour? I'm guessing a lot of you would at least for $100 an hour. Well, if that's the case, I want you to think about how much it would be worth to you to just take some hours of your day and think about your finances to develop a plan. My guess is for you, if you spent, say, 20 hours working on your personal finances, I bet you would generate a tremendous amount of wealth for yourself over the course of your life. Okay, everybody works real hard at their job. I bet you're putting in 40 hours a week plus. But when have you taken the time to just sit down and think about how you're going to develop your wealth through time? Because I guarantee you, if you spent 20 hours, you're going to develop thousands and thousands of dollars in extra future wealth for yourself. All right, pay yourself, figure out how to manage your finances, and that'll be worth more than whatever you're making at your job this week. I really do guarantee that. So again, I want to thank you so much for your time. I don't know what you got out of this, but I really do appreciate you for joining me today. Um, feel free to reach out if you've got any questions. I know these slides are also going to be shared as well. I'm not doing anything extraordinary here. I'm just showing you the types of things that are really straightforward in personal finances, the main ideas. So I hope you learned something from it, and I want to thank you for attending. Well, everyone, let's give um, Dr. Evans a virtual round of applause. That was fantastic and lots of information gleaned on that. And if you will, let's just give some feedback. If you guys will just enter in one to three words what you got out of it in the chat, that would be amazing. If you just had to quickly summarize in one to three words your, your biggest takeaway, that would be awesome. I also want to offer an opportunity in the time that we have left for any questions. So feel free to um, raise your hands and unmute or um, type it in the chat really quick because we want to make sure that you all have opportunity to utilize the expertise that Brent has brought with us today. Yeah, I'd absolutely be thrilled to answer any questions you have. Uh, about 35 years ago, I was, uh, I'm probably the oldest guy here, but about 35 years or so ago, I was the director of time benefits for a major company and therefore over the pension department. And in those days, the planning assumption was about 8% a year return on investment. Has that changed over time or was that because of fees or I'm just curious on that, on that point? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And, and obviously, there's, there's no perfect answer to your question of what the expected return would be. 
Um, so when I say 10%, that's just based on historical averages of the S&P 500. So if you look at the S&P 500, just returned about 10, 10 and a half percent. Honestly, I would say using seven or eight percent is probably a better way to think about things just because I think being a little bit conservative is probably smart. So, yeah, when I, when I think about my own personal finances, I do typically use seven percent. Uh, I also do think it's probably smart to, to factor in age. So for college students who I deal with a lot, maybe using nine or 10 percent is a little bit more reasonable because they have more years for their money to grow. So they might expect to get closer to the historical average. But as you get closer to retirement, it may not be reasonable to think that you can get a 10% return over a shorter window. So like you said, I think 8% is a really practical uh, number to use for a lot of people. Thank you. Absolutely. Sure. We also have a question in the chat. Kyle Brogdon said, how do you feel about the strategy of paying off a mortgage as quickly as possible? And where do you put that in your rankings? That's that's an absolutely excellent question. And I know that's one that's one I thought a lot about. Um, and what I hear a lot from from this decision, I don't know if you've really researched it all, but a lot of times the argument is made that you might pay off your mortgage early as kind of a, an emotional win, um, that it really feels good to uh, get that mortgage off your back. But I, I will say if you locked in a mortgage at a low interest rate, it's really hard to justify paying it off early. So I'll just use myself as an example. I got really lucky. We bought our house in 2020 and our interest rate on our mortgage is below 3%. If that interest rate, uh, I think just paying down the minimum is probably at least mathematically the optimal move. So for example, my mortgage rate, if it's 2.75%, all I need to do is, is earn a return beyond 2.75%. Uh, to come out ahead financially. So for example, if I've got $20,000 in my hand right now, one thing I can do with that $20,000 is put it into my mortgage. In doing so, I'm avoiding 2.75% interest. Alternatively, I could take that $20,000 and put it in stocks and maybe I generate you know 7 to 10% return. So as long as you're comfortable with maintaining debt, mathematically, it's really hard to argue against uh, you know just paying on the minimum on that mortgage. Now, that being said, if your mortgage interest rate is maybe something you opted into in 2023 and you're getting a 7 or 8% mortgage, now I think a case could be made for paying that mortgage off early. So uh, what I often say is, you know, there's kind of a rule of about 5%. If your mortgage rate is below 5%, don't pay it off early. If your mortgage rate's higher than 5%, you might think about paying it off early. Um, but that math only works if you're also going to invest any extra money you have. If you just spend that extra money on a new car or something, well, then it would have been better off paying off the mortgage. Uh, so I hope that helps. Yeah, it's a tough decision, though, for a lot of people. We have another question in the chat. Joseph Nunley says the information on target date funds was truly enlightening. So not a question, a feedback. Thank you, Joseph. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, if you haven't done so already, look in your 401k plan. Uh, maybe perhaps you haven't looked at it in a few years. If that's the case, check again. Because those target date funds have become uh, become ubiquitous, really, uh, in the financial planning world. And just a few years ago, you really didn't see them. Are there other questions out there? Yes. Uh, Lucas has question. another question. What do you, how do you feel about um, um, investment management, uh, outside investment advisors? In other words, um, you know, some arguments are that they are, can better invest your money than you can as uninformed, et cetera. And, and I've heard all sides of that argument. So uh, i just love to get your opinion on that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have two feelings on this. Um, one, I can tell you that financial advisors, historically, if you look at academic research, Financial advisors really don't have any sort of special ability to consistently beat the market. Um, very few do. In fact, if you look over about a 30 year period, only about one or two percent of financial advisors outpace the market as a whole. So I don't doubt that there's some financial advisors that do have skill, but the market just works so well. The market is just so incredibly efficient that it's really difficult to do better than the market does as a whole. So what I would say is financial advisors do a, can potentially do a really good job of, of sort of getting people to invest their money, keeping them on the right track. So if you employ a financial advisor, one thing they'll do is you know, keep you from pulling your money out of, the, uh, out of the market when you're scared. That's something a financial advisor potentially can do very, very well. But when it comes to picking stocks and deciding where to invest, 
to be frank, I don't really believe they have any special skills there. I think if you just put your money in some sort of well-diversified fund, you're probably going to beat most of, the, most of the financial advisors out there. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? Going once. Going twice. Okay, well, thank you so much again for joining us for our um, first of four sessions for this year for the GCSU Alumni Lifelong Learning. We thank you so much again, Brent, for sharing that information with us today. Um, he has shared his email in the chat. So if you have questions, please feel free to send them to him. And we are looking forward to the resource that you're sharing with us here in a year. Um, I know I personally am looking forward to it and we'll try and drum up some excitement around that. So as soon as it's released, let us know and we'll share that with our alum as well to, to support and to, to get that quality information. So thank you so much everyone again for coming. Please also, if you will remember to um, check out the information that we shared in the chat about the Adventures of Greece tour uh, trip that is happening this May. We'd love for all of you all to uh, attend the information session and find out more about that. And uh, if you have other thoughts or questions about things that you'd like to see in the way of this series, please also feel free to email us at alumni at gcsu.edu. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, and we hope that you have a great rest of your week. Um, alumni, if you're in the area, please also feel free to come and see us at Deep Roots this Saturday at the tent. We will have um, some things for you there and it's an opportunity for you to gather. So that's our upcoming event that we have this weekend. But thanks again, everyone. And we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.